and welcome to the opening OP Jindal Distinguished Lecture this spring of 2021. I'm Leela Gandhi. The Jindal Distinguished Lecture Series was endowed in perpetuity by Sajan and Sangeeta Jindal to promote a serious discussion of politics, economics, social and cultural change in modern India. Today's lecture will be delivered by the renowned political theorist, scholar, and teacher, Uday Singh Mehta. This will be followed by commentary from our eminent discussant, Faisal Devji from the University of Oxford, whom I will introduce at the end of this lecture. Looking ahead, the second Jindal lecture of this series will be held this Friday, April 16, between 12 p.m. and 2 p.m. EST. Please do join us again. Professor Uday Singh Mehta is distinguished professor at the City University of New York. He was previously the Clarence Francis Professor at Amherst College. He has also held teaching positions at Princeton, Cornell, MIT, the University of Chicago, the University of Pennsylvania, and at Hull. Uday Mehta received an undergraduate education at Swarthmore College, where he studied mathematics and philosophy. He holds a PhD in political philosophy from Princeton University. Professor Mehta's body of work is characterized by a rare mastery of multiple intellectual and philosophical traditions. His writing combines these traditions and also gives us an intellectual history of their intersection, more often through the conflicts and uneven encounters of modern European imperialism. We now know such to include the devastation of the environment, enslavement and indenture, and the enduring impoverishment of large parts of the world, to name but a few. In his bracing corpus, Mehta highlights the collusion rather than contradiction between the emancipatory Euro-American liberal tradition on the one hand and the considerably less than emancipatory project of Euro-American imperialism on the other. Mehta's first book, The Anxiety of Freedom, Imagination and Individuality in the Political Thought of John Locke, 1992, is a brilliant exegesis of the ambivalence at the heart of the liberalism with which John Locke is commonly identified and which requires a vision of the human as simultaneously free rational equal and equally capable of murder, theft, and mayhem. Mehta's path-breaking second book, Liberalism and Empire, 2000, develops these intimations into a searing critique of how imperialism stemmed from liberal assumptions about reason and historical progress. The insights of this particular book are amongst the sine qua non of post-colonial political theory. Liberalism and Empire was awarded the J. David Greenstone Prize for the best book in political theory by the American Political Science Association. In 2003, Mehta was one of 10 recipients of the prestigious Carnegie Scholars Prize given to scholars of exceptional creativity. In both his trailblazing books, Professor Mehta evinces an unusual gift as well for something we might call philosophical portraiture. He writes with verve and texture about John Locke's fascination for the human propensity uh, for madness, or the conservative Edmund Burke's unexpected 
and melodramatic aversion for Britain's arrogant paternalistic colonial expansion. This particular gift is very much on display in Mehta's many luminous essays on M.K. Gandhi, in whom he identifies a template for divergent, capacious, and resoundingly original political futures. Mehta's forthcoming book is tentatively titled A Different Vision, Gandhi's Critique of Political Rationality. Gandhi is also the subject of his Jindal lectures at Brown this spring. I should say much awaited Jindal lectures at Brown this spring. Professor Uday Singh Mehta will address us today on the topic critiquing empire and the challenge of representation, Gandhi and the nationalists. Over to you, Professor Mehta, and welcome to Brown. Thank you, Leela. Uh, let me start by thanking uh, 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 friends and family, um, uh, some of whom are in India um, uh, and elsewhere. Um, I also want to uh, thank uh, uh, Stephanie Pandey uh, 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 Abbott. Um, uh, and uh, I want to thank the Watson Institute and uh, uh, Brown University and uh, 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 <clears throat> the Jindal family. Uh, and uh, finally, I, I want to thank Ashutosh for inviting me in the first place. And uh, as I look at the list of uh, uh, previous uh, uh, Jindal uh, scholars, uh, I want to single out uh, uh, Pratap Bhanu Mehta, uh, because as you will see, uh, much of my uh, talk has to do with courage. Um, and uh, uh, Pratap Mehta uh, showed uh, exemplary courage uh, uh, two weeks ago um, in uh, resigning from Ashoka, um, and uh, uh, he withstood uh, for many years um, uh, the pressure that was put on him by the government. Uh, and uh, finally, he did the honorable thing, which was to resign. Um, um, any case, I want to single him out. Um, uh, and I also want to single out Leela Gandhi, um, uh, for giving me that generous introduction. Um, uh, now, uh, as a general matter, uh, Gandhi uh, was skeptical about familiar conceptions of democracy, which typically feature the importance of institutions such as regular and inclusive in uh, elections, representation, individual rights, a privileged importance to values such as freedom, equality, and security, the conviction that the people are sovereign, all of which translate into the need for a state that embodies their sovereignty, embodies and articulates their power. This did not mean that Gandhi always opposed this familiar view of democracy. Yet none of these ideas taken individually or in conjunction had a special appeal for him. For Gandhi, democratic institutions and ideas, <coughs> for Gandhi, uh, democratic institutions and the ideas associated with them did not coalesce to form an ideal uh, of how to organize collective life in the way that they did for Locke, Jefferson, Mill, Lincoln, and Nehru. Instead, Gandhi's democratic sensibilities gathered around the idea that all human beings, including those of the humblest description, had potentialities such as not fearing death, that of cultivating these qualities, they, in, 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 that by cultivating these qualities, they were in a position to transcend questions of power, including imperial power, <clears throat> 
authority and order uh, and, and be driven by order, security, and a concern with mere life. For Gandhi, it was the democratic potential implicit in the human ability to have courage, to sacrifice, to be patient, the things uh, I will return to in, in my lex next lecture, and not democracy as a political institution, which was the ground of his most insistent and demanding idealism. That idealism, even in the midst of the anti-imperial struggle, was never primarily political in the ordinary sense of the term. It represented instead an ethic in which the utterly mundane and the transcendent were held together in the quest for self-knowledge, <clears throat> uh, which both anchored, which was both an anchor and a guiding beacon. By placing courage and other virtues that I've just mentioned at the center of this vision, vision Gandhi offered a critique of modernity, which in his view constituted the strut, struts of contemporary life. He viewed the empire from within this broader set of considerations. In his well-known essay, What is the Enlightenment? Immanuel Kant gave a remarkably simple answer to the, to the question posed in the title of his, of his inquiry. Enlightenment, he said, was the human, <coughs> was the human emergence from its self-incurred immaturity. Because the immaturity was self-incurred, its redress turned on two human qualities, courage and thinking. The motto of enlightenment, as Kant announced it, drawing on the Roman poet Horace, was sapere aude, have the courage to think. Among the many things that made this emphasis on courage and thinking <clears throat> remarkable was it ide identified enlightenment as something attitudinal, hence dis disassociating it with a particular time period or a region of the world or a level of material and cognitive achievement or with a series of social and political processes or significantly with a stage of civilizational and institutional accomplishment. In the 19th century, with thinkers such as Hegel, Marx, Herbert Spencer, and Mill, it was precisely these sort of temporal <clears throat> and geographical markers that came to be associated with progress and modernity and implicitly ideal, uh, uh, enlightenment, even, uh, and of course, the empire. They also typically projected an articulate, uh, articulated political framework as the essential condition for human self-expression and modes of governance. A striking aspect of Kant's text is the rigor with which he absolves the idea of enlightenment with any teleological connection, either with the past or with an anticipated future. Enlightenment was entirely voluntary. It did not have to, <clears throat> it did not have its counterpart in the prehistory of modernity or in a segmented geography, but rather in a series of attitudes which, which he variously characterized as laziness, the comfort of being guided by others, a rendering of freedom as something substantially pri uh, private, or more broadly, just a lack of courage. <clears throat> Kant was in effect connecting three important concepts, courage, public reason, and human dignity. What mattered to him, and as I will suggest in greater detail to Gandhi, was not the movement or logic of history understood in social and political terms, but a specific attitude undergirding behavior and life. Enlightenment referred simply to the ever present uh, possibility of self transformation and engagement with the extant conditions under which one found oneself. Being enlightenment, be, being enlightened did not have any connection with history. It 
it could be said at this point, <coughs> it, could, it could happen at any point <coughs> in time or in any place. In that sense, it was different than the Enlightenment, which of course was mainly associated as a European phenomena, associated, uh, also associated with modernity. In the history of modern Western political thought from the 17th century onwards, one can identify at least three points of emphasis that persist into the contemporary era and which have retained their salience during the intervening three and a half centuries. They constitute the main basis of political society and a principal feature of the rationality that courses through its functioning. Many thinkers such as Rousseau, Mandeville and Vico did not accept this account, at least not entirely, but that is another story. The first idea is that political society can offer the only reasonable redress to the insecurity, fear, and the prospect of violence, which individuals in its absence, in its absence had good reason to expect. Second, that political society, once it once formed, must itself expect to be the object of competition and potentially of violence from other political societies, and therefore must have the resources to contend with this insecure and permanent predicament. And third, political societies in best dealing with this predicament and with other exigencies of power, of politics, including domestic threats, must be unified and hence there is something in the nature of a political imperative to cultivate that unity, a unity that is specifically political. The empire was essentially part of this way of thinking, as were the objections to it. At the core of the empire, at least modern Western empires, was not a blunt assertion of power, but rather the claim that it could do all these three things, that is, it could defend those over whom it ruled, it could represent them, and finally, it could do these things because the empire was the basis of their unity. The empire was essentially a pedagogic or developmental project. The response of their critics, of its critics, was similar, though in reverse. They contended they were in a position to defend themselves, speak on their own behalf, and represent their own unity. Both groups were making claims about history, with one group saying, uh, uh, with one side saying, you're just not ready. The other side saying, we are ready. Even the nuances between these two positions had the same structure. There were those who claimed that you will never be ready such as the racist, or typ uh, uh, such as uh, racists typ typically do, or geographical determinists, those who claimed that <coughs> what, what made people backward was the influence of history, or paternalists who thought that the appropriate analogy was <coughs> the familial an an analogy between fathers and children, uh, the language of fathers and children, in which the tutelage was temporary just because childhood was temporary. Corresponding to these claims of, <coughs> of those who opposed, were, the, were, were those who opposed the empire. Some claiming, some claiming that they had always been ready. Others that a particular region of the world was better suited for self-governance and yet others saying they had been ready from a specific period. Uh, yet, uh, what both sides had in common was that they were each making political claims, political in the sense that I've just specified. <clears throat> it has been said that every assassination is a joint communique between the assassin and the assassinated. This was the case with those who endorsed the empire and those who opposed it. Gandhi's position was starkly different. The three ideas I've just identified as defining politics are commonplace. They give us an account in which <clears throat> the principal ground of politics 
is a sense of physical vulnerability at both an individual and collective le level. The principal motive for it is the formation of fear, uh, for its formation uh, 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 is fear, an overriding and an overriding concern with self-preservation, both again, both uh, at an individual and, connective, and collective level. The fact that politics also is associated with other imperatives, such as justice, enhanced material well-being, or <clears throat> in the democratic tradition, with the establishment of institutions that give expression to the idea that individuals are free and equal, or that the power of the state should be limited and accountable, does not undermine the claim that an important, uh, in, uh, an important tradition of modern political thought has been guided by Hobbes's rendering of the <coughs> Latin expression, salus populi suprema lex esto, where salus no longer referred to salvation, but rather the safety of individuals and more importantly, to the security of the political society as a whole. It's around these concepts that, mod that, that European, mod European modernity articulated its own understanding as producing a culture which contained while never eradicating the fear of death, uh, <coughs> but never eradicating the fear of death um, uh, 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 and created the conditions of peace and hence the conditions for the exercise of freedom along with other lauded values. This was, as I've said, the narrative of, na of the nationalists. Uh, this was the narrative that nationalists typically accepted or borrowed adding the caveat that freedom and security of the nation had to be vouched for by the people to whom it belonged and to whom <coughs> and, 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 and who belonged to it and to whom it belonged. Whatever particular, <coughs> whatever the particular form that the nation assumed, whether republican, despotic, or anchored in a shared allegiance to a common faith built around the uh, built around traditional authority of ruling families or clans, they all projected themselves and sought legitimacy for the power that they wished to yield by emphasizing the primacy of security and the importance of unity. There are, of course, other traditions of modern political thinking in which the formation of political society is not rooted in the bellicosity of a natural condition, nor in which this, uh, a social contract among individuals serves as the basis first, uh, as the basis of first exiting that bellicose natural condition, and second, a concurrence on the principles by which they are to be regulated thereafter. In Hegel, for example, there is neither a bellicose natural condition nor an appeal to the social contract as regulating and constraining and constraining. Uh, the ideal for political society. It is the self-consciousness of freedom and not the enduring motive of fear that spurs reason's long tutelage in history. Similarly, John Stuart Mill, in the brief remarks he makes uh, as, as relevant preconditions for the principle of liberty, offers an account in which the struggle against despotic power has finally brought Western civilization and its public culture to the point where it can be improved by free and equal discussion. But again, <coughs> but, but even in Hegel, <coughs> Mill, and, 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 uh, and, and later, uh, and, and for that matter, Rousseau and Kant, political society, once it is formed, is wedded to the primacy of individual and collective security. Mill's capacious conception of individual liberty after all, has its limit at the point where physical security is threatened. By way of contrast, it is worth recalling that fear in corporeal security plays scarcely any role in articulating the motives for both forming and sustaining political society in the political thought of Plato and Aristotle, and more generally, the ancient world. And this, despite the fact that Greek city states, uh, Greek city states were regularly embroiled in war and conflict. 
fear and security <coughs> acquire their salience as markers of the political only in the modern era. In this abstract and highly simplified overview of the broad, broad strokes of modern political thought, I have emphasized three things as characterizing both the cause and the effect <coughs> of political society and its rationale. They are, they are fear, a concern with security, and the foundational value placed on political unity. For the remainder of this lecture, I will reflect on what the implications might be of these three ideals if they were held not to be true or normatively credible. I do this by considering Gandhi's thought and writings and to a lesser extent, his actions. I deflate the role of public actions, of his public actions, because, <coughs> uh, <coughs> uh, because to understand them fully, one would need to consider their, sur their surrounding historical context. And that is neither appropriate to my competence, nor to my specific purpose, nor to the specific purpose I have in mind. I wish to take Gandhi seriously as a thinker, because I believe he was a very serious and interesting thinker. But since he's also a figure of great historical importance, it, is quite dis it can be quite dissatisfying to largely ignore his historical role. I think the best way to deal with this is to acknowledge the fact or the charge and move on. At any rate, in, the terms of, in, in terms of his thought and writings, there is good and ample reason to believe that Gandhi did not subscribe to any of the three ideas I have out outlined as being central to modern political thought and practice. Regarding the first idea, he did not think that corporeal vulnerability was in need of redress. Its existence was an ir ineradicable fact of life subject to contingency and moral response. He embraced the fact and the contingency and made it the very ground of crafting a morally meaningful response to it. The central feature of this moral response was an unconditioned endorsement of truth. He emphasized the etymology of the word satya, truth, <coughs> uh, coming from Sat, which referred to absolute being, it ends to God. Truth called for a special, uh, for a particular kind of devotion that was not conditioned, that was not conditional on security or self, or self preservation. He certainly did not believe that the only redress to the fact of vulnerability and fear of death was the formation of political society. Instead, he accepted fear that came, uh, uh, expected, accepted the fear that came with vulnerability by transmuting it into the ground for courage and courage in which there was a permanent willingness to surrender or sacrifice one's life. In doing so, he blunted what I've identified as the principal motive of political society, fear and the prospect of security. For Gandhi, and he emphasized this literally hundreds of times, individual and collective, and the, the individual and collective analog to truth was correct, was, was courage. As he said, quote, the path of truth is for the brave alone, never for a coward, end of quote. Courage, while it blunts the motive of, for political society, also extends the ambit of moral action to everyday life. One must, for Gandhi, always be prepared to sacrifice one's life for the sake of moral action. This is why the scene of battle in the fratricidal war at the heart of the Mahabharat, the Boer, the Boer War, the First World War, or the Jewish predicament in the Second World War all constitute exemplary sites for Gandhi, for moral action for Gandhi. He was drawn to the battlefield because it exemplified something commonplace to him. It was the model 
of everyday life, not the exceptional predicament against which to con construct a political refuge. He could it could serve <coughs> as such as a model because the fact of violence and insecurity were themselves facts of everyday life, not something that could be quarantined or pacified by political society or anything else. The very ubiquity of violence in the natural state, which for Hobbes served as the ground for a sequestration of the social on the political and a presumption in, friend, in favor of the logic of the latter, for Gandhi served as the basis for articulating the universality of ethics. Consider Gandhi's interpretation of Arjun's dilemma in the battlefield of Kurukshetra when the will to fight his own kinsman was deserting him. Quote, let us suppose that Arjun flees the battlefield. Though his enemies are wicked uh, uh, and sinners, they are his relations and he cannot bring himself to kill them. If he leaves the battlefield, what would happen to those vast numbers on his side? If Arjun went away, leaving them behind, would the Kauravs have mercy on them? If he left the battlefield, the, Ko the Pandav army would simply be in annihilated. What then would be the plight of their wives and their children? If Arjun left the battlefield, the very calamities which he feared would have befallen them. Their, their families would have been ruined and the traditional dharma of these families and the races would be destroyed. Arjun therefore had no choice but to fight. Two points are significant here. First, Gandhi does not see Arjun's plight, uh, Arjun's actions or inactions as diminishing, diminishing the fact of war and violence. In either event, war and violence would persist. As with nonviolence, so too with Arjun's actions in the battlefield. They do not intervene or uh, to quell or sequester the fact of violence. Second, on Gandhi's interpretation or rendering of Arjun's, no, that Arjun has no choice but to fight because violence itself is written into the very texture of the ex existential situation he confronts. The resolution of the dilemma, uh, the resolution of Arjun's dilemma could not be settled by choice in the ordinary sense, where ethics in stems from the am amplitude of alternative possibilities, but rather by the moral meaning his actions under conditions where precisely such choice was absent. He could act in a way to retain moral meaning so that the act was not instrumentally linked to some future condition, but instead was backed by a personal comportment that, was, uh, that, that Arjun was attentive to. Indeed, by invoking the effect that Arjun's plight or flight would have on the wives and children of the Pandavs, Gandhi means to associate morality not with a heroic condition, but with the commonplace facts of social life. It is striking that Gandhi should offer the mundane, almost banal social fact of Arjun being a brother-in-law and an uncle as being motivationally relevant to his joining such a momentous battle between the forces of righteousness and those of evil. Gandhi accepted the battlefield and the fact of violence as a quotidian thing that required an exacting, but again, quotidian courage, while the tradition of politics identified it as an exceptional condition, one to which it gave a permanent, even if qualified, warrant. For Gandhi, the battlefield functions as the crystallization of a sight that calls for fearlessness and courage, which for him was the essence of truthfulness and virtue. <clears throat> 
Gandhi is simultaneously undermining two familiar sets of distinctions between the ethical and the political and the everyday and the exceptional. He will not countenance a reality that surrenders the ethical understood as action guided by moral imperatives to the larger uh, purposes of the political. Similarly, <laughs> he sees in the most mundane aspects of life, of everyday life, the same exacting urgency that is typically reserved for exceptional situations. For Gandhi, the demand for security is the demand of a desert, deserter seeking to flee the battle, not being prepared to sacrifice him or herself. It is important to recall that Gandhi reserved his highest admiration for sacrificial figures, such as King Harishchandra, who was prepared to sacrifice his own long sought after, long sought after son to fulfill a promise he had made to the God who facilitated the son's birth. Even the much invoked king of Ayodhya, Ram, is celebrated as a rather ordinary figure, as a son, brother, father, and husband, who was prepared to banish and see his wife suffer and die in the name of duty. Gandhi seldom mentions Ram's <coughs> uh, uh, rule as a king, or the privileged location of Ayodhya, the capital of his realm, and the alleged place of his birth. But he always singles out the quality of his sacrifice. Gandhi himself would have gladly <coughs> singled out, uh, 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 gladly assumed that role, as as he made clear in his as he made clear in his autobiography, and would have allowed his own wife to die by denying her the beef broth on which, according to the attending physician, her survival depended. Gandhi's life is replete with examples of his own willingness to die. Indeed, it has often been pointed out by spurning the police, the, uh, the security detail that was urged upon him in the famous, in the fractious months of 1948, he all but invited the death that ultimately felled him. The link between ordinariness, self-sacrifice, and, moral, and morally meaningful action was evident perhaps most controversially in what Gandhi urged, urged the, the, the Jews to do in the face of the might of Hitler and the Nazis. In 1938, many were seeking his guidance on the matter of how the Jewish people should behave. Gandhi's response was to urge the European Jews to self-sacrifice if they had a mundane connection with Germany or wherever they lived. He said to the Jews, if you are born and earn your living in a place that is, you think of these as your home, then you should be prepared to let, quote, the tallest Gentile German shoot you or throw you into a dungeon, end of quote. Gandhi was in effect making the mundane the ground for moral heroism. The willingness to die in the face of a morally obnoxious power was the basis of living a morally dignified and full life. The willingness to, to be sacrificed was next only, was next only to the requirement of absolute truthfulness, which Gandhi required of Satyagrahis. They had to be prepared to die without resorting to violence. Even in this demand, Gandhi vouched for the ordinary. After all, Satyagrahis were ordinary people. Yet Gandhi demanded, Gandhi thought they were capable of the ultimate sacrifice fearlessness and courage that truth entailed. And that too, by a, that too, without assuring them of even a hint of security. Gandhi had been suggesting far from wanting to muffle the challenge of death, 
under the assurances of politics or subsidiary notions such as sovereignty, wish to make them make it in all its exacting implications, utterly intimate and unsparingly constant. One might say by way of contrast in which there are important affinities that for Kant, the elevations of knowledge and reason were the only pure access to the absolute, including crucially the, <coughs> the, 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 the including crucially <coughs> the absolute of the moral imper imperative. But for Gandhi, the absolute and the moral imperative had to, be, had to ratify themselves by something much more mundane, courage and fearlessness in the face of death. In this orientation, there was an altogether different vision of life in which the transcendent was nested in within the routines of the everyday. European modernity has also articulated itself around another category, different though closely related to the political namely the social. There is, a familiar, <clears throat> there is a family of familiar accounts often linked with the magisterial work of Norbert Ilyas and the civilizing process in which civility referred to the slow accretion of new domestic and public pra pra practices which produced what came to be known as a civilized society. The broad impetus for this was the intermingling of new groups of people who had to accommodate to each other's differences. Over time, this process produced a society that displaced the, old, the older language of etiquette and manners, along with feudal and aristocratic norms, and thus paved the way for an ascending liberal and commercial order. In Keith Baker's work, which focuses on French history, the, I, the fact, the idea and the fact of society was a response to the epistemological, moral, and religious challenges that marked the 17th century crisis of values. Society, he wrote, <coughs> quote, was the invention of a human middle ground between certainty and doubt, religion and relativism, despair and uh, this grace and despair, absolute power and anarchy, end of quote. Moreover, it had within itself the resources that would give a society, especially the middle classes, the energy and the sense of purpose to gradually displace violence with legality, extend the ambit of trust beyond the family, widen the scope of empathy and reciprocity, while also securing the basis to exploit and govern the working class, control subaltern groups, and in its liberal imperial, guys represent itself as a progressive force for much of the world. Gandhi abstained from every aspect of these broad narratives of society and social development. He was indifferent to the historicism that is essential to these narratives because nothing of any importance in Gandhi turns on the logic of historical development. He viewed Satyagraha as something which escaped the political and social processes with which history was typically concerned. Quote, Satyagraha being natural, it is not noted in history, end of quote. This did not mean that he thought of human beings as living in some timeless zone of immobility, only he did not accept the typical social and political narratives which history offered up as the basis of individual and collective self-understanding. He did not, for example, think that Indian civilization had to be, had to or should conceive of itself as, as bound to a teleology whose inevitable outcome would be the nation state or a condition of economic modernity. Correspondingly, he abstained from endorsing the driving frictions that are internal to these historical narratives accounts such as class struggle, increase in the productive forces, the logic of capitalist development or imperialist expansion, or the impulse to enlarge the domains of social and political freedom through constitutional commitments. Such abstentions 
did not make him indifferent to the social and political woes, such as deprivation, gross inequality, exploitation or abuse, or the abridgment of rights. It was just that his views on these matters did not share the causal logic that typically organizes such narratives. He abstained from these accounts for a simple reason. Society as a project of whole scale refashioning was simply not a problem for him. His thought is not spurred by the Manichaean, cons cons the, uh, Manichaean contrast that underlie and guide <clears throat> so the vision of so much of modern political thought, where the only alternative to political order is the social and diabolical ravages of anarchy. It is not that Gandhi accepts or commends every extant aspect of society. Clearly he did not, as is obvious from his work on the problem of untouchability or, <clears throat> and the Hindu caste framework and many other social wars. But even on these matters, his emphasis is not on social development or producing a new kind of society marked by radical rearrangements of, so, uh, radical re rearrangements of social relations or ruptures in the existing patterns of life. Gandhi was never drawn to the dream of a new kind of society or of a new kind of man. His vision comes from a palette that draws on the materials of every of ordinary life. He could and did imagine a society with different hues and shapes without nevertheless replacing the palette itself. For Gandhi, the rigors of civility, ethics, or to use the term he preferred, Satyagraha, were meant as a way to alter the relationship of the self to itself and to the world. Gandhi's thought, <clears throat> as anybody familiar with his letters and their obsessive attention to meals, ablutions, medicines, schedules, and even <clears throat> to things, uh, and even to things, knows is never free from a focus on the precise conditions of life, even when he is urging fearlessness and a willingness to die. There is a social focus here, but nothing like a social agenda. The challenges of civility rose from the very midst of the actuality of society. But it did not require conceiving of society as itself a problem. This orientation in this orientation, there is a profound indifference to the logic of history. By way of contrast, it is hard to imagine Gandhi ever writing the following sentences, which come from Nehru's discovery of India, and which capture the broad thrust of, Gandhi, of Nehru's view of Indian society. Quote, Indian life became sluggish, uh, became a sluggish stream, living in the past, and moving slowly through the accumulation of dead centuries. The heavy burden of the past crushes it and a kind of coma seizes it. It is not surprising that in this condition of mental stupor and physical weariness, India should have deteriorated and remained rigid and immobile while other parts of the world marched on ahead. The end of quote. These thoughts anticipate what, be, what would become the Nehruvian emphasis on the state as a medium of reforming a recalcitrant society equipped with the expertise of modern science and knowledge spurred by an ideology of progress and social justice prepared when the need arose to deploy the blunt power of the police and, and, <clears throat> and always relying on a cadre of uh, expert leaders. Here indeed was an appropriately social and political vision, fully divested of any transcendent purposes offered in supportive response to a familiar reading of European and colonial history. Despite Nehru's unremitting weariness 
the images of mourn and the images of mournful death and lassitude. There is an unmistakable optimism in this project. Judith Klar, in her famous essay on the liberalism of fear, emphasized the notion that <laughs> emphasized notions such as self-sacrifice were good acts of super arrogation which fall outside the realm of politics, end of quote. For her, all forms of political spirituality stemmed from a contempt of physical experience and thus typically served as excuses for, quote, the orgies of destruction, end of quote. Gandhi would have agreed that self-sacrifice was not a political duty. In this sense, he shared Schlar's view that politics must be chastened and limited, that its task was not to offer <coughs> the prospect of human perfection. But the idea that the vision associated with ethics and self-understanding, which for Gandhi, like for Kant, rested on courage, and for which Gandhi, unlike Kant, included self-sacrifice, referred to a juncture where the imperatives of politics and ethics met or conditioned each other. Gandhi's passions found their clearest focus in the myriad often trivial, uh, of often trivial details that make up the texture of everyday life. He wanted to infuse that life with the spirit of civility as he understood it. The courage of, of being willing to die was deeply intertwined with the essential question of the human, which for Gandhi always was always conditioned by the transcendent and the utterly mundane. In this sense, for Gandhi, in this sense for Gandhi, courage and fearlessness were portals of a, a sort of spiritual truancy, which he thought, which he sought to plant amidst the mundane patterns of everyday life. To that broad purpose, nothing turned on the logic of history. Thank you. Thank you so very much, Professor Mehta, for that uh, extraordinary uh, lecture. Um, it is uh, now my tremendous pleasure to um, introduce um, our discussant, for Professor Mehta's uh, lecture. Faisal Devji is Professor of Indian History and Fellow of St. Anthony's College at the University of Oxford. He is also a Senior Fellow at the Institute for Public Knowledge at NYU and Eve Ultimar Chair at the Graduate Institute of International and Developmental Studies in Geneva. As Head of Graduate Studies at the Institute of Ismaili Studies in London, he has directed postgraduate courses in the Near East and Central Asia. Professor Devji has an undergraduate degree from the University of British Columbia, where he received double honours in history and anthropology. He received his PhD from the University of Chicago and has been a recipient of the prestigious and competitive fellowship, junior fellowship at the Harvard Society of Fellows. He's taught at the New School, Yale University and the University of Chicago. His highly original and subtle work gives us conceptual histories, modern Islam, the development political thought in modern South Asia, the remaking of Muslim politics from the late 19th century into the middle of the 20th, Islamophobia, Islamic militancy, and more broadly, ethics and violence in a globalized world. Professor Devji is one of those rare political theorists who gives credence to extra mundane inspirations for mundane political projects. 
in a dazzling body of work that includes Muslim Zion, uh, Pakistan as a Political Idea, 2013, The Terrorist in Search of Humanity, Militant Islam and Global Politics, 2009, Landscapes of the Jihad, Militancy, Morality, Modernity, 2005. His work on M.K. Gandhi is simply amongst the most original and provocative in the field, as in his 2012 book, The Impossible India, Gandhi and the Temptation of Violence. I'm eagerly looking forward uh, to what uh, um, Professor uh, Devji has to say to Professor Mehta's account of Gandhi's at uh, um, um, mentality. Um, uh, Professor Devji, the floor is yours. Thank you very much, Leela, for that uh, very generous introduction. Um, and Uday for that really wonderful uh, lecture. Uh, you know, Uday and I have been following each other about the world for many years now. Uh, we met initially when we were at Harvard. Um, Uday was at MIT, I was at Harvard. Uh, then we followed each other to Chicago where we both taught and then to England uh, and then back to America again. And now we have been separated by the Atlantic Ocean. Uh, but it, it has always been a rare privilege uh, to converse uh, both in person and by reading his work uh, with Uday, not least about uh, Gandhi, uh, a figure of great interest, obviously, to both of us. Uh, I have learned uh, an immense amount from Uday, uh, and it really is an honor and a pleasure to have been asked uh, by Ashu to uh, comment on, on today's uh, lecture. So let me begin then by uh, restating in slightly other words that Uday himself used uh, what I take him uh, to be saying uh, in this lecture, or at least how he presents uh, Gandhi's uh, slipperiness uh, from the point of view of European political thought. Uh, so on the one hand, they suggest that Gandhi refuses both the spatial separation of spheres characteristic of liberalism, for instance, the separation between public and private, war and peace, political and social, but also uh, that he refuses the critique of this spatialized separation of uh, spheres uh, launched by someone who remains ghostly, whose ghost seems to haunt Uday's lecture, but who was not mentioned in it, uh, Carl Schmitt. Uh, Carl Schmitt's idea of the sovereign exception as a temporal separation rather than a spatial one. Um, so it seems on the, you know, it seems that Gandhi uh, is a thinker who refuses, who refuses both spatial and temporal forms of separation, forms of separation that are meant to de demarcate the realm of the political. Uh, yet we know that given Gandhi's approbation, wholesale approbation of social difference and his resistance to universalist conceptions, this refusal cannot really be seen uh, as a recommendation of uh, homogeneity of any kind either, of a kind of uniform field of contestation in which you can no longer draw any distinction between say the political and the social to use two terms that Uday has in his lecture. Nor uh, can Gandhi be accused of uh, leaning towards the, uh, another kind of liberal conception of difference uh, in which all differences are reduced to equivalence uh, from the point of view, say, of a third party state. Uh, he was set explicitly against this manner of thinking about difference. So how is it then that Gandhi can refuse to distinguish between, say, war and peace uh, as far as the reach and operation of nonviolence is concerned, uh, which Uday described so wonderfully, while yet at the same time routinely doing so in his naming practices, because we know that Gandhi uh, constantly uh, 
refers to his very famously in famous terms, the fact that he has to return to the political arena to wrestle with the serpent of politics, to wrestle with in its coils. Uh, and then sometimes he withdraws from that arena. Uh, so on the one hand, he, he, he seems to refuse these distinctions, either spatial or temporal. On the other hand, he names the political and the non-political routinely. Uh, now, the battlefield, for instance, as they described it, can become a quotidian site of moral action within the self, as Kurukshetra uh, is described by Gandhi. He says, you know, this is not a battlefield that actually uh, was a historical one. It cannot be found in any physical geography, but it is a battlefield that exists within each individual, uh, the battle between good and evil. Right. That's one way in which an external battlefield can be internalized in a, a, a completely quotidian way, to add another example to the many that, that Uday gave us. And yet the battlefield uh, which Uday's lecture focused on is also made, as he pointed out, into the privileged site of moral and not political action, whether in 1914 at the very beginning of the First World War, when Gandhi uh, uh, you know, is in London, he arrives just as the war begins and he volunteers as he had done so, as he had done in South Africa during two previous wars uh, to set up an ambulance corps for service in France on the Western Front. And one of the reasons we know he does so is because he needs to um, uh, save himself from the, what today you might call bad karma of living in safety in London. Uh, and therefore profiting uh, from the protection of the Royal Navy and participating in its violence uh, in order to, uh, to rid himself of this bad karma, he actually needed to be on the front and risk his life uh, to cancel out that karmic load or the karmic weight. In 1918, when he's raising uh, soldiers for the war uh, again in Europe, this time from India, uh, at various points during the Second World War, uh, when he thinks that the battlefield is the, you know, is is the is a site of virtuous action and the possibility of nonviolence, or indeed at the very end of his life in 1948 during the first uh, war between India and Pakistan, uh, which Gandhi saw as offering perhaps, in its very inevitability, the possibility of nonviolence. Um, now, it seems to me that what Gandhi is doing uh, in all these instances is reversing the position that war and peace uh, uh, tend to play in political thinking. Uh, it is, as Uday, I think, suggests, the battlefield uh, that becomes the site of morality, not of politics. Uh, and as a consequence, it is the latter, the realm of peace, uh, that becomes the site, the privileged site of politics. Uh, for as Uday tells us, if politics is concerned uh, with life and security, um, it is precisely in everyday life, uh, in the realm of peace, uh, that politics has its place. Uh, whereas morality, has its privileged site on the battlefield uh, where sacrifice and death, also quotidian issues, as Oday points out, uh, have their most privileged instantiation. I am reminded of uh, the conversation that Gandhi has in 1937, which I've written about uh, with one of Hitler's henchmen, Rudolf von Strunk, uh, who had been in charge of supplying arms to the fascists in the Spanish Civil War, he came to see Gandhi to talk about Gandhi's interest in health. Uh, and uh, when Gandhi begins to speak with him, uh, once Trunk is embarrassed, he apologizes for the violence of the Spanish Civil War. And Gandhi says to him, no, you don't understand. That's not the problem. Uh, what I admire uh, in Europeans is their willingness and their abil ability to throw away their lives. That's not where violence comes from. Violence comes from uh, their desire to protect life. Uh, and there is a contradiction there. You can't throw away your life 
and want to protect it at the same time. Uh, to throw away your life uh, is the sign of great moral courage or can be. To protect your life uh, is what introduces violence into the picture. Uh, so it is security and life uh, that are the greatest uh, instigators in Gandhi's view of violence. It is this then that makes the soldier on the privileged moral site of the battlefield into the privileged moral agent of that site. Uh, and for Gandhi, the soldier is in this sense, very curiously like the figure of the child whom he also talks and writes about as a moral figure of a similar kind, because both the child in its playground and the soldier on his battlefield, um, both these figures uh, act in a, on, on their respective sites in a way that must discount causality, history, and the future. Um, they must act in the realm of the present alone because they do so in a sacrificial manner, uh, because they cannot actually predict um, uh, their future. The child, because the child is enclosed within the, 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 the site of the playground and is purely focused in Gandhi's view on the present. Uh, the child's very dependence on his parents or his or her parents or preceptors means that the child is absolutely attentive to the present in a way that adults cannot be. The soldier is absolutely attentive to the present precisely because he too is dependent on, on the rules and the orders of others, uh, but he also must face the possibility of death at any moment. He cannot actually think the future in Gandhi's view. So despite the fact that a figure such as Arjuna, whom they mentioned, is brought to the battlefield of Kurukshetra uh, by a tortured causal logic, a historical logic, in which he had played, of course, an important role. Once on that battlefield, uh, just as Gandhi uh, wanted to be on the Western Front with his ambulance corps, once there, uh, that history, as it were, was canceled out. And the possibility of the karmic load uh, um, that each man bore was also canceled out in the same, uh, in the same moment. Uh, the battlefield, existed as a site of pure presence uh, that could open up different kinds of futures, uh, yet futures that remained unthinkable. So in some ways it is the very disregard of life and security, uh, the soldier's disregard of life and security on the battlefield that ends up inadvertently uh, safeguarding them uh, by leaving the future open to any number of possibilities for virtue. And of course, as you know, Gandhi believes uh, that virtuous means will inevitably result in virtuous ends. They do not, those ends need not be predicted, predictable, or, or indeed thought, um, because that would make them into, that would pull them back into the causal language of karma, uh, where they could only be betrayed because something that you predict and want to create, uh, even your success in creating that future uh, may rebound upon it or upon you. So the karmic chain is broken on the battlefield just as on the child's playing field, uh, as if these sites are sites removed from the uh, flow of history and from the causality of history that marks historical narrative uh, to become sites of, say, pralaya, you know, the universal dissolution between, uh, between aeons. Uh, and it is on such sites as these, therefore, that moksha, uh, who they also spoke of, uh, liberation becomes possible. Now, of course, without history, since the battlefield is a site that is purely present, just like the playing field, Without history, there also is no ontology in some way, uh, which is perhaps why nonviolence, like non-cooperation and non-possession, uh, 
uh, all key Gandhian words um, are negative uh, terms, grammatically negative, or are uh, phenomena uh, that are held in suspension. Um, they don't have being in any positivist sense. Uh, Nonviolence, therefore, is not a posi positive term like peace uh, because it can occur anywhere um, as if in a kind of strange um, uh, foreboding of, of Schmidt's argument about the sovereign exception occurring anywhere at any time. Uh, Nonviolence, too, brooks no boundaries, no borders. It can happen in the midst of a battlefield. It can happen elsewhere. Um, uh, and that is what I think uh, gives its negative form uh, such meaning as it possesses, unlike peace, which is always bounded by war, for instance. Um, when you think of a term like shanti, uh, which means peace in some sense, but also silence. It's literally a term that cannot, that has no voice, uh, that has no presence in some sense. Um, it can occur anywhere. Uh, so let me end then by suggesting that uh, from what Uday has told us, uh, at the heart of war on the battlefield is in fact the non-political, um, is the moral. Uh, Gandhi, in his commentary on the Gita from the 1920s, uh, describes it in this way. He describes the Kaurava army, the evil army of the Prince Duryodhana, as being held together not by the evil intentions of that prince, uh, but rather held together by the acts and feelings of courage, of loyalty, of friendship, of bravery and of sacrifice that link um, the soldiers of that army to one another. Any army, Gandhi suggests, uh, can only be held together by these indubitable virtues, uh, even if it is deployed for an evil intention by its leaders. So on the very field of battle, it is virtue that subtends evil itself. Um, and it is these virtues of courage that they spoke about, of sacrifice, of bravery, of loyalty, uh, which of course are linked to uh, what they described so well as the quotidian or everyday life of friendship, etc., and not therefore to the high political uh, category of something like peace. Um, it is rather politics, whose violence characterizes um, life, security, uh, and all those desires uh, that go into the making of peace. Um, so let me end here by suggesting then that though they did not mention this uh, thinker, I'm thinking of Michel Foucault, uh, it is almost as if um, he ends his lecture with a kind of Foucauldian glance uh, at the Foucauldian vision of the political as having been internalized uh, to such a degree that war has, as it were, uh, entered into the intimate part of peaceful coexistence. Um, uh, it is now inside. It doesn't exist outside. It has no externality uh, of its own. Uh, Gandhi, uh, I would argue, uh, can be placed alongside Foucault in this sense uh, at, any, uh, at any rate, except of course, uh, his focus is on the battlefield as the site uh, of morality, uh, something that Foucault did not uh, end up uh, speaking about. Thank you. Thank you so much, Faisal, for your rich commentary. Uh, um, as I uh, am about to invite uh, Uday, uh, Professor Mehta, to respond briefly to Faisal, and while this is happening, 
Um, may I invite those of you who are in the audience to, um, um, you know, please, please um, submit your questions. You will have to do that through the um, chat function. I see that someone has raised their hand, um, but I think in order to kind of manage uh, uh, the, 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 the gathering. Uh, please, uh, 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 Shankaran, I can see you've raised your hand and others. If you could just type in a question, uh, I will read it out to Uday when the time comes. So while you're doing that, um, um, uh, please, uh, uh, may I invite um, Uday to respond to um, Faisal. Mm. <clears throat> Thank you, Faisal, for your characteristically uh, thoughtful remarks. Uh, <clears throat> uh, so uh, about Schmidt, uh, uh, there was a paragraph um, in the longer version of this talk, uh, which I uh, deleted, uh, that had to do with Schmidt. Um, um, uh, <clears throat> uh, so uh, that's... Uh, uh, just uh, by the wayside. Um, uh, I, I found your comments uh, especially interesting because uh, I, I think uh, the, this, this idea of internalizing conflict, I think this is central to Gandhi. So uh, the idea that the battlefield is internal is uh, I think it's central. Uh, uh, it, it reminds me uh, of Freud. Um, uh, uh, as you know, that for Freud, um, uh, it is internal conflict uh, that is central to uh, overcoming uh, neuroses. Um, uh, 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 you know, uh, uh, and I think um, the precursor to Freud is a figure like Gandhi, um, because um, uh, for the reason I just said, because everything significant in Gandhi happens inside the person. Um, and uh, I think uh, that's true of Freud. It's true of Foucault. Um, uh, towards the end of Foucault's life, uh, he talks about the technologies of the self. Um, 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 you know, uh, so, so um, the link I see here is that uh, uh, for Foucault and for Gandhi, it's self-discipline that makes for moral action. Um, uh, uh, I know you, you made a, a bunch of other points, um, uh, uh, but uh, I leave it at that. Um, I have a, a simply a, 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 quest, a, a, a message from Keola Ag Agath who says no questions as the lecture and commentary were very rich and absolutely, absolutely fascinating. It gives material to think about. Thanks a lot for this. Uh, once again, um, I urge you to um, um, formulate a question. It can be a one-liner. Um, I uh, see my uh, colleague and friend, Ashutosh Varshni has a raised hand. And um, as uh, the director, and host of this event, he gets to um, speak as a person rather than a disembodied uh, bit of text. Um, so uh, Ashu, over to you. Thank, thank you, Leela. Um, Uday, um, I'm not a political theorist. I do consume a lot of it, but I don't produce it. What? Um, I said, I, I, I consume a lot of political theory, uh, <laughs> or, or what, what I would call political philosophy, actually. We also do political theory, but of a different kind. The normative political theory, I call political philosophy, basically. Uh, 
Um, I don't produce it, but um, so my questions come to you from somebody who takes political philosophy very seriously, but does empirical work. Mm -hmm. um, I have always been the kind of political very... philosophy I respect most. Okay. <laughs> I've always been uh, very um, drawn to um, an article that Mandela wrote on Gandhi for a, the last issue of the century, last issue of Ma Time magazine of the century, right? Mm -hmm. Last century. Mm -hmm. And it's a fabulous two-page essay. Um, and he actually talks about uh, using part of your language, um, nonviolent courage and violent courage. And my question, and I'll then I'll just read this out, and then I'll connect connect it to the to the to what Gandhi was advising the Jews to do in Hitler's Germany or German lands in general in Europe. Uh, so this is what this is what Mandela says. Gandhi remained committed to nonviolence. I followed the Gandhian strategy for as long as I could. But then there came a point in our struggle when the brute force of the oppressor could no longer be countered through passive resistance alone. And he, I think he initially used the term Satyagraha, but this is Time Magazine's uh, translation of it, passive resistance alone. Um, so we founded uh, a militant side uh, of our struggle uh, we started a militant, we added a militant dimension to our struggle. Um, and um, in 1962, when, uh, when interrogated in the court, I stated, and I quote myself, force is the lang only language the imperialists can hear, and no country became free without violence. End of quote. As he goes on further in this uh, in this uh, essay, he basically raises the following question: the uh, that nonviolent courage, willingness to die, as opposed to willingness to kill, willingness to die. Yeah. Uh, would be a suitable instrument of action, mm. however you wish, wish to define suitable here, mm. yeah. internally, externally. I think in my, I'm, I'm talking about external uh, utility more than the internal, but you could interpret it internally as well. That the suitability of nonviolent courage depends not only on your uh, desire to better yourself internally, but also on the nature of the adversary. Mm. If the adversary thinks of you as non-human, as beastly, as like an animal, then uh, non-violent courage is of no use. It will not produce anything in the world. Mm -hmm. And and uh, it's not clear what the internal value might be either by dying for something that is uh, that is not entirely worthy. Uh, you're dying like an animal. You're not dying like a like a like a like a human being because your humanity has been completely denied by the adversary. So when this Jewish question emerges, how how should Jews deal with 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 uh, Hitler and fascism, one important analytic uh, uh, implication of Mandela's point, and a point I think which has been raised by some others also, that if if Hitler thought that Jews were not human, that they were like beasts, whatever you know, and you whatever term you wish to, but not not human. Then Gandhi's advice to Jews to practice nonviolent courage and to be willing to die, that advice is absolutely of no use. Right? 
So how would you, I had, I had a question about Rousseau also, but I think others should participate and there are quite a lot of questions in the, ch in, in the chat room now. Uh, how would you respond to this? Uh, uh, my interpretation of why, what Mandela is saying and then extending that to the Jewish question in Hitler's Germany and Gandhi's view, Gandhi's advice to Jews to practice nonviolent courage and to be willing to be, to show willingness to die. Uh, Ashu, that's a very, very thoughtful question. Uh, I have two things to say. I have uh, a bunch of things to say. Uh, to you and, and through you to Mandela. Um, uh, the first is, um, I don't think, uh, as I said in my lecture, I, I don't think Gandhi wants to change the world. So if you think of uh, the uh, three things, or I don't know how many things that uh, he emphasized, um, spinning, silence, and uh, uh, celibacy, I think. Um, none of them produce anything. They don't intervene in the world. They are not uh, they, they don't have a product. Uh, uh, in fact, at some point he says, um, uh, one of the things that he likes about celibacy is that it doesn't produce anything. So it interrupts the process of production. Um, uh, similarly, at some point he says, um, the emphasis on spinning, on Khadi, is not because he thinks that Kali, the, the production of homespun cloth, uh, will challenge the monopoly of Lancashire. He doesn't, he's not such a fool. Spinning for him is a kind of internal act. It is to cultivate that kind of requisite self-control, self-discipline, um, uh, be precisely because it doesn't have a significant product. So th the issue of intervening in the world is not central to him. Now, coming to the issue of the non-human. So one reason he thinks that the caste system has to be changed is precisely because untouchables were not treated as humans. They were thought of as animals. And that's why in his interchange with uh, Ambedkar, he says, um, Ambedkar uh, just thinks that the caste system has to be destroyed because it can't be reformed. Gandhi famously disagrees. He thinks it can be reformed. Why? Because you can make the non-human into human. Uh, do you understand what I'm saying? Yeah, yeah. yeah. I, I, I'm familiar with the debate also. Okay. I'm with um, Gandhi on this. Yeah. Uh, so, uh, but then why should India have independence? Why should India not continue to be ruled by the British? Is it because the British rule was 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 uh, destroying the internal lives of, of Indians? Is that the yes, reason why? Yes. We should... it, it, it was making them, uh, I mean, first of all, except later in life, uh, when he started 
calling for independence. Uh, I think he did that only uh, after the Quit India movement. Um, uh, but before that, uh, he was perfectly happy that India should be part of the British Commonwealth, that it should have um, this, uh, I don't know, it should not, he was not invested in India being an independent country. Um, at least I don't think so. Um, uh, and, you know, uh, mm, Yes. So the word I was looking for is dominion status. You know, way after most nationalists thought dominion status was a secondary form of existence, Gandhi was perfectly happy with it. And another example, um, in, uh, one of the places where uh, Gandhi intervened in the constitutional process was that in the original constitution, uh, there were, uh, you know, high uh, expectations or high bars for the British to become uh, Indians. And Gandhi opposed that. Uh, he opposed it simply on the grounds that uh, they're not foreigners. We shouldn't treat them like foreigners. Uh, you know, it's a controversial position, uh, uh, but you know, uh, uh, there you have it. Okay. So, I mean, so so to summarize what I'm saying, I don't think, at least till the, I don't know, late 30s, um, he didn't call for independence. Um, <clears throat> uh, I mean, in his reflective works, he never characterizes the British as exploiters. So, uh, and for me, that's linked to the fact that, you know, he, if he was a nationalist, he was a very, very unusual nationalist. Uh, so, uh, um, again, for the sake of time, let me stop there. Uh, we have a mountain of questions here, and indeed, I'm, I'm uh, not sure that we will be able to accommodate them. So I'm asking Grace to please save the chat um, so that we can send it on um, to Uday. I'm going to ask, read out an, a, a question from Shankaran, who uh, had to write it out. Uh, and then I may have to ask you something that's sort of burning question uh, uh, myself, which is completely unethical, given the long <laughs> list. But, but, you know, hey. Um, uh, so Shankaran Krishna says, one central claim you make is that both Kant and Gandhi are exceptions to the modern developmentalist teleology inherent in Western liberalism and such a big source of the idea of empire. You point further that both apologists and critics of empire bought into this teleology. However, how sustainable is the exceptional status you attribute to Kant and Gandhi once one includes in the ambit of analysis what one might call the anthropological writings of both men, specifically Kant on Africans and MKG on Kafirs and untouchables. Uh, are critics of Gandhi's patronization of Dalits and denial of independent agency to them, noted from Ambedkar to Arunthati, a to A, simply wrong in discerning in Gandhi a sequestration of even the right to practice Satyagraha to the twice born and to the Dalit to merely await her liberation upon the upper caste's self transformation. Thank you, Shankaran. Thank you so much. Uh, thank you, Shankaran. Um, uh, uh, these are uh, very thoughtful questions. Um, uh, <clears throat> I think uh, um, I've answered one of them uh, already. This question of um, his attitude towards Dalits. Uh, 
uh, and there's a version of that question uh, in terms of his attitude towards women. Um, now, let me just restate what I stated. Uh, I think uh, uh, his, uh, what in the question, uh, the, the questioner uses the term patronizing. I think the, the Gandhi's commonly thought of as patronizing attitude towards uh, Dalits and Africans. Uh, and this has recently uh, come into uh, some discussion. Uh, is not that. Um, they are, for him, um, uh, how should I put it? Um, uh, they are uh, they are for him, they are outside the ken of something, but they are not, they're treated as though they're non humans, while for Gandhi they're not. So I think, uh, in this sense, uh, mm, uh, Gandhi. Uh, has uh, internal to Gandhi's thinking is some in, something that is internal to imperial thinking, which is that um, mm, with time, uh, these people can be improved. Um, uh, so uh, with time, uh, Dalits can be bought into the fold of being human. Um, uh, and, you know, uh, that in itself, uh, um, you know, is a pretty offensive idea um, uh, because uh, as Ambedkar says, we are human. Uh, 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 so uh, in case, uh, 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 there was another part of your question. Um, I can't remember. Yeah. What was it, Shankar? Um, it was uh, uh, our critics of Gandhi's patronization of Dalits and denial of independent agency to them, simply wrong in discerning in Gandhi a sequestration of even the right to practice Satyagraha to the twice born and the Dalit to merely await her liberation upon the upper caste self transformation. So the one word answer is yes, they're wrong. <laughs> um, you know. um, yeah, I, I, I think they're wrong. I think they're wrong. Um, so very quickly, Ode, am I right? Am I, if this, is this a misreading that there is a way in which your absolutely transformative case for the, the quotidian Gandhi displaces ahimsa in favor of abhaya that that courage is is and why is that what you're doing and why because uh, why why that I there is a way you. I I say, you. that there is a, is it true that you are demoting in gandhi uh, non harmfulness ahimsa uh, for the case that you are making about courage uh, uh, because there is a way in which non ahimsa is the stuff of you know belongs to the angels, uh, mm -hmm. and uh, abhaya is indeed the matter of you know uh, one's scanty existentials. Um, you know it, it it is it is existential and quotidian, and um, so is this what you are doing? Uh, are you are you favoring are you favoring courage over non harmfulness, and therefore abhaya over ahimsa? And, and if so, that's quite radical. <laughs> uh, and and why, might, why, why might you be doing that if you're doing that at all? I, I think for the reason uh, Faisal said, I think uh, for him, uh, nonviolence is, is a negative category. Uh, it... Um, it doesn't do anything. 
uh, while courage uh, is a positive category. You, you can choose to be courageous uh, in a way in which I don't think you could choose to be nonviolent. At least I, I don't think Gandhi thinks that. You know, um, uh, so does that answer your question? It does, and it provokes a much longer conversation. I mean, I, I in a sense that the, uh, because then of course th that if one, yeah, because the negativity of nonviolence is surely accommodated in the dazzling originality of Gandhian action, or, you know, uh, via, via the Arjuna example as a kind of actionless action, as a kind of action, not an inaction, not yeah. an inaction. Uh, um, uh, so that it is a choice, it is original. Uh, it may be negative, but there's no reason why it is not prior to violence. There is no I, reason I, why I, I don't suddenly. I, sometimes I lose what you're saying. You, I can't hear you. I, I, just sometimes ahimsa may come before himsa. And this is a question for Faisal as much as for you. It may be a prior ontological negativity. Mm -hmm. uh, um, but I take your point. I don't necessarily agree with it, but mm -hmm. I see it as, as, as radical. Um, uh, I don't agree with it, uh, that it is, if that is what Faisal is saying as well, and if I might draw out Faisal uh, too, I, I don't agree that it is not a choice and that it is not creative, but I see that one can take it away uh, in favor of courage, which is, which is radical. Um, mm. Um, I have a, a, a question, actually, one of those uh, uh, sort of creative questions from Mary um, uh, Omerod, saying, what would Gandhi have thought about the Black Lives Matter protests in the US? Are they a battlefield? Um, I know this is, uh, requires you to be prophetic um, uh, and oracular, but... Uh, mm. Mm. I think um, mm, I, 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 I'm having a hard time distinguishing what I think from what Gandhi would think. Uh, um, uh, I, I mean, given that, uh, let me say what I think. Um, so I, 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 I think, um, uh, it does have many of the features of a, a Satyagrahi movement. Um, uh, and the reason why it has these, in my view, is because it's asking for respect. It's not asking for anything, in a sense. Uh, it's saying Black Lives Matter. That's what it's saying. It's not saying, give us this. Uh, and in that sense, uh, it's different than the reparations movement, mm -hmm. where you're saying you owe us something. That's, as I understand it, that's what the reparation stuff is all about. It's saying, you did this to us, for centuries, you have a debt to repay to us, pay it. I think the uh, BLM is not doing that. It's just saying, uh, show us some respect. Uh -huh. Thank you. That's a, a absolutely wonderful answer. Uh, there's a, 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 a to the point uh, to to the point of our conversation and what you are saying. There's a, a question from Maya Joshi. Uh, much food for thought, Professor Mehta. Thank you. A rather obvious question. Wasn't Gandhi's constructive program an attempt to change the world, or at least a part of the world? Mm -hmm. You emphasized his disinterest in productivity but wasn't a man who made shoes and spun cloth 
both of which were to be worn, and one who emphasized the value of time and on bread labor in the ashrams, not interested in productivity? Uh, fantastic question. That's a very good question. Uh, um, uh, just yesterday, um, this is an aside, uh, I'm co-teaching a course with uh, Akil Bilgrami. Uh, and uh, mm, yesterday we were talking about this um, and uh, uh, mm, so, so uh, a key, uh, uh, I should call him Professor Bilgrami's point was that uh, 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 what Gandhi, what Gandhi found appealing about the constructive program was that it did not, uh, it was predicated on people having commerce who knew each other. Uh, and in that sense, the products that people produced in the constructive program were for people you knew. Um, so, uh, mm, uh, uh, mm -hmm. So let's take shoemaking. Okay. What I understand of shoemaking, the reason why shoes had to be made was A, they were useful. B, they were not, if they were made in Andhra Pradesh, Gandhi was opposed to them, to them being sent to Chennai to be sold there. So what he opposed uh, was a kind of mercantilism where mercantilism was dependent on selling commodities in distant places. So uh, this is a, a, a standard uh, claim about uh, the history of empire that uh, the prehistory of the empire is mercantilism because mercantilism is what produces trade at a distance and that morphs into you know the empire which is also a particular kind of uh, extended uh, form of economic linkages. And that uh, Gandhi opposed. Uh, so uh, so the, 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 the reason why Gandhi thought um, the nexus or the central nexus of uh, economic and authority relations should be the village was it because it put, it muffled the possibility of centralized power. Um, so I, I, I want to ask, uh, who was that? Who, whose question was that? Um, Amaya Toshi. Uh, is that, uh, what you had in mind when you brought up the uh, uh, the constructive program? I, I'll wait for her to reply. Uh, 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 but in the Lila, 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 may I? Can you can you allow my restlessness and curiosity two more minutes? One minute. Sure, sure, sure. Why not? Okay. Um, Uday and uh, Fazal. Um, 
can we introduce the concept of epistemological break to understand or can we use that concept to understand how gandhi thought of africans um and dalits maybe before 1904 1905 19 right and by 1910 or ni- at some point after 1905 or 6 or 7 he is not using the term kafir he is not he is not saying that their liberation depends on the self transformation of those who are privileged but a, a much more comprehensive concept of human betterment and and widespread agency emerges after that epistemological break Re- recall that althusser used it to separate young marx from old marx used the concept of epistemological break to say that in anyone's intellectual and political life there are breaks that emerge mm-hmm. so i whether fazel or you want to answer uh that curiosity of mine that i think i think he used the term kafir he is patronizing towards africans but yeah. he is only 27 28 29 years old at that time fazal i'll defer to you well thanks i mean i think that um uh, obviously gandhi does change um and he tells us he changes uh in fact he tells us not to um look favorably upon his earlier mm. uh, uh advice and take him only at his later advice mm. uh, so he's very uh, uh you know he's uh, he uh, he sets great store by that and in doing so he sort of fragments his own trajectory if you will and you sort of see that even in his autobiography which is fascinating you know the, you know the autobiography is actually not a story of causality mm. uh it's a story of things happening to him as yeah. it were uh you know his various temptations uh you know gandhi's life is stitched together he learns obviously uh but it's almost as if the autobiography autobiography is a kind of rehearsal of um uh, of the way in which you might cancel out what i called your karmic a uh, uh, burden uh, you know how do you, how can you actually do that uh, on the question of race i'm not so sure about the epistemological break uh, i think there's certainly a political break uh, in that uh, as you say ashu he starts talking differently uh, both about dalits in india later on and earlier on about africans uh, though when you look at his uh, um what he says about africans in south africa uh he is speaking of course there mostly as a lawyer as a lawyer for the indian uh bourgeoisie um and he does what a lawyer in the south african court system must do um rely upon racial language because it was a it was a system of justice that depended upon racial categories uh the moment he stops being a lawyer he stops using the, those terms i think the more interesting question is actually what no one has actually done uh is to think about what rash racial categories might have meant in a language such as gujarati um uh, i see you know i mean i'm from east africa and i know uh certainly that there were highly derogatory forms of thinking about africans and derogatory language whether this language and these forms were equivalent to or even linked to european forms of biological racism is another question altogether because the gujarati terms at least the ones that i know and the ones gandhi would have known actually belong to a different universe which does not make them better it just means that we need to understand the the the, the thing that we that we take for granted in this debate which is now a global debate is precisely what racism might have meant uh, we know what it might have meant for people in the antebellum south uh and we know it might have meant for other people here and there but we actually don't know what it meant for gandhi or for the gujarati community or for others for that matter and i think we can't make a decision without having a really proper history of that and that might get to the epistemological epistemological break because ideas of race might actually change i think that's where the question needs to be asked okay 
Yeah, so there's another question for you while I've got you. Incidentally, Shankar and Krishna wants us to know that the epistemological break like just didn't happen for Gandhi. Um, so but how is he so sure? Uh, well, you know, uh, I, I, I think I think Fazal, Fazal is saying that question still needs to be probed whether a break happened, and that requires going through Gujarati or texts and Gujarati. I think mean, that Fazal's answer is much more. Um, it seems to me intellectually grounded in a, a proper phenomenology of 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 that of that of that is required for answering the question. I, I think what Fazal just said is. Uh, very sophisticated. I, I mean, I, I should confess that I, I don't speak any Gujarati, but uh, 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 I, I do think what he sa uh, said uh, uh, makes a lot of sense. I mean, you know, he's, I, I think what Faisal, correct me if, if I misunderstood you, what you're doing is that language needs to be contextualized. Is that right? Yeah. That, that words have to be contextualized, that, that you can't just um, translate words. It's not that you, if you have a English to Gujarati dictionary uh, and you can't just translate it, you know, you know there's, there's, there's a, um, uh, yeah, uh, so. Uh, uh, the burden of questions, really, as I see them, I mean, uh, the quarrel with Faisal, it seems to me, is that is the interiorization of the battlefield. Uh, mm -hmm. And I mean, I think, and the quarrel with Uday is, is consequentialist. Mm -hmm. uh, is right. your Gandhi uh, consequentialist or not? And I mean, you know, uh, so, if, you know, if, if you would like to, we, we are short of time, but if you could respond, um, quickly to, to these each. And Prigupati Singh has a question about heroes, what happens when heroes are dead? Uh, uh, you know, does, does an ethos continue? Um, uh, any comments from both of you, I think on these two points? Uh, so since you want me to be br brief, um, I don't think uh, Gandhi is consequentialist. Huh. Uh, uh, I don't think so. Really, 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 you don't think so? Yes, no, I don't think so. I okay. think, uh, I think what he is is um, uh, so. So, so it, it depends what you mean by consequentialist. Do you mean that uh, he is weighing um, good? Uh, do do you, in philosophy there are various different. Sure. conceptions of consequentialism. The sure. most familiar one is where you ask the question, is the consequence of this uh, positive or negative? And I don't see Gandhi as ever asking that question. Because the question itself presumes on a product. And if I'm right, uh, the only product Gandhi is concerned with is something internal. And th therefore, it can't be assessed, at least not in this ordinary way. What do you think, uh, Faisal? I agree with you, actually, I, you know, which is why I'm uh, myself so keen on thinking about, uh, you know, Gandhi's focus on the present, uh, on, on fragmenting yeah. uh, historical ge genealogies and narratives, on, on the possibility uh, of acting purely in the present mm -hmm. and of foregoing the future and in doing so actually making it richer, uh, but only by ignoring it. It's a curious thing that he's doing. Yeah. Yeah. You know, that, uh, the I, refusal I, I, to attend upon it. I, I uh, completely agree with what Faisal has just said. So you both take to heart very much the fruits fruits of action maxim. Yes. Yes. Um, all right. Well, to be continued. Uh, uh, I, I I leave uh, very many wonderful questions un, unarticulated.
but we will make sure that they are uh, shared with uh, Oday and Fezel, both of whom I thank from the bottom of my heart for a truly, uh, uh, truly scintillating session. Uh, what a treat. Thank you and thank you to Ashu as always for his um, generous hospitality. Thank you, Thank you, thank you Leela. Thank you, Leela. Thank you, Uday. Thank you, Fezel. Yeah. Thank you. Thank you very much.